Good morning, everybody. I am JC Moore with the Biodiversity Education and Awareness Network, or BEAN, um, and we are going to get started. Hello, I am Steve Hounsel, Chair of the Ontario Biodiversity Council. I'd like to welcome all of you to our Ontario Biodiversity Summit, Nature-Based Solutions for the 21st Century. I also want to briefly introduce you to the Ontario Biodiversity Council, now in its 16th year and the host of this summit. We are a provincial level organization that has come together to achieve the vision and higher order goals and targets that have been set by Ontario's biodiversity strategy a 10-year strategy that aligns with the Global Strategic Plan for Biological Diversity and its associated IACHI targets. That strategy is a blueprint championed by Council for an ecologically sustainable future for Ontario, its biodiversity and its people, something we believe is well worth pursuing. We occupy a unique space that links global biodiversity targets with both national efforts and more local implementation efforts. We are working to mainstream biodiversity across all sectors and at all scales in an effort to protect what sustains us. It is embodied in the very membership of council with some 38 organizations from a broad constituency of industry and industry associations, conservation and environmental groups, natural heritage institutions, academia, indigenous organizations, and the provincial government, all united around the theme of protecting what sustains us. Our biodiversity. So again, I welcome you to our virtual summit. We hope that the summit will connect people from across Ontario, Canada, and around the world to talk about, celebrate, and most importantly, take action to protect biodiversity and advance nature-based solutions for a more sustainable future for all. You'll be hearing about the alarming state of biodiversity at multiple scales, including from here in Ontario, and the absolute need to bend the curve on biodiversity loss as we pursue a new deal of people living in harmony with nature. It is also an issue that is intertwined both in causation and in solutions with climate change and the pursuit of sustainable development goals, and hence our focus on nature-based solutions. More importantly, you will be hearing about practical solutions to move us towards a more inspired future for all. Remember, the future is all about choices choices that we collectively make. We will be hosting a number of webinar sessions starting in late May and ending in October. You can find descriptions and outlines of each session on our website, ontariobiodiversitycouncil.ca. We encourage you to register for as many as you can, and yes, they are free. I believe there is something in this summit for just about everyone. We have brought together leading edge thinkers and experts on biodiversity together with practitioners from many fields to help lead the way towards meaningful, practical, and cost-effective solutions. Let's this be the start of an inspired journey to a more sustainable future. We also realize that we need many perspectives, and most notably, indigenous perspectives, knowledge, and connectedness to nature in order to achieve the transformative change that we so desperately need to address the issues of biodiversity loss and climate change and the pursuit of sustainable development. Now, this was not a small undertaking. It takes a lot of work and organization to pull off such an event. I want to thank our summit planning team and session leads from the Ontario Biodiversity Council. These folks have been working tirelessly for months to bring this summit together. Thank you so much for getting us to where we are. In particular, I want to thank Sarah Rang, Executive Director, and Colin Cassis, of the Invasive Species Center for hosting our webinar sessions. It is a huge and much appreciated contribution. And a very special thank you to our sponsors. Sponsors like Ontario Power Generation and Ducks Unlimited Canada, among others. It is because of their collective support that this summit is happening. I also want to respectfully recognize, recognize the lands where we reside and from where we work. Since time immemorial, the Indigenous peoples were self-reliant and well provided for through their own ingenuity and use of the gifts of the land, living in harmony with the balance of nature. We, the Ontario Biodiversity Council, acknowledge that the land where we meet on and strive to protect is the territory of the Anishinaabe 
and the Haudenosaunee peoples, but now is home to many diverse First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people. That is also true for the many people participating in our summit who may be residing on unceded lands. I'd also like to recognize the critically important role of our Indigenous peoples in conserving biodiversity as teachers of traditional knowledge for promoting and enlightening us on ethical space and two wide seeing and as valued members of the Ontario Biodiversity Council. I'd now like to ask Dorothy Taylor, elder, water walker and knowledge keeper of Curved Lake First Nation to share some important words with all of you. And first by way of introduction, Dorothy Taylor, is a Mississauga Ojibwe elder from Curve Lake First Nation. She is known for her work and traditional teachings about the sacredness of water. She shares traditional knowledge and ceremony within her community and various organizations throughout Ontario. She is a hand drummer and a singer. Elder Dorothy Taylor is the founder of the Sacred Water Circle, inspired by traditional Indigenous teachings and leading with hope and spiritual courage. The Sacred Water Circle sees a restored relationship between human communities and water. She has served as a volunteer on the Petroglyph Advisory Council of Curve Lake for 12 years. Currently, Dorothy is the co-chair of the local United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 6 on clean water and sanitation, sponsored by the Kawartha World Issue Center. She lives in Curve Lake with her husband, Mark, and two sons. Over to you, Dorothy. Oh, to me, what, Steve? Uh, Nimki Kapanashi Quan, Dishna Kaz, Wabagog Dodem, Washki Kamang Donjaba, Gitchenend of Sanongam, Minka Kinamage Al Sagil Sagil Sustainable Development, should call that. My name is Dorothy Taylor, and I'm very, very happy to be here and be invited to be speaking regarding uh, Indigenous environmental knowledge to such an uh, esteemed group of people who have worked so hard and care so much for our natural world. I was asked us to share a little bit about, about my, my understanding of in, uh, Indigenous environmental knowledge. And first of all, what I want to say about that is as Indigenous people, and I'm talking uh, around the world, the globe, that that we see, uh, we feel, and we interact with the natural world, more of a, a familial relationship. As you know, we refer to the globe of of Mother Earth as mother. We call her mother. When we look gaze upon the sun in the sky, uh, we refer to the sun as grandfather. And when we look upon the moon night sky, the moon is grandmother. And all the trees and animals and six insects and, and the birds, they're our brothers and sisters. So you see how we have a familial relationship with the land, not necessarily a stewardship, because in our stories of creation, water was created first, the land was created next, and everything else was created that lives upon this world. But it was the human people, us, the four colors of men, that came to this, this land, the Mother Earth experience, I call it, because we're only here for a short time. We were here last. And so we have, they welcomed us as the children of the Earth. So when we refer to our interaction with the natural world as stewards, to me, the word steward is, is the definition as, you know, as maybe something in which a person control or organizes uh, their interaction with the world. And, you know, that's not our, our job. Our we have to have a different perspective on how we interact with the land and with the water. Because to Indigenous people, the, the, the water itself has a spirit, a living spirit. And, it, and the lakes, the oceans, 
the rivers, even the water that falls from the sky. It is, it is, it is the, the veins of Mother the Earth. And when we interact with the water, the, our elders say that we must show gratitude to the, or speak gratitude towards the water. So many of you who, who work on the land and you're always near water, say on a daily basis in your language, be it English, Korean, Chinese, mm, Italian, or Ojibwe, which is miigwech, say miigwech to, the, to that water. It hears us and it has a memory. In terms of the land and the trees and the air and the fire, you know, this is, these are elements that must be treated with respect. So we have more of a, a spiritual relationship with the land. It's more than a, an element. It's more than a, it, it goes beyond being a resource. We actually have a spiritual familial relationship with the land. So as uh, the four colors of men, we must all remember our original directions as we left the creator side. And just in brief, brief, brief reference to one of a certain part of our creation story, the white race was given the, the, the obligation to look after the air. The, the yellow race to look after the element of fire. The black race to look after the element of fire, of, of water. And the, the red race to look after the land. As native people in the, in the on Turtle Island, which is the, the continent of North America, we believe that we still remember our obligation and that's the obligation to the land. As you know, many as you when you turn on the TV and you 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 look on the news, it's always the indigenous people who are leading me, many of those protests uh, and, uh, on oil and, and mining and and forestry and such, because we believe that there are certain places on our land that have a spiritual power. There, it's a sacred place. Sacred meaning it has a connection to the higher power. So what I shared with you today in, in conclusion is that what, number one, we have a familiar relationship to the land. We believe that land, water, sky and air, that's, they have, they are, are, we have a spiritual relationship with it, with, the, with creation. And also, it's very important that on a daily basis, we speak gratitude towards those gifts the Creator gave us. And that we're not necessarily stewards of the land, but, most, but primarily, we must live in harmony. And, and, and we have to live in, a, in a, a balanced relationship with the land. So what I shared with you this today, I just hope that what our elders from present and beyond and, and, and pr prior who have taught me the little bit that, I, that I'm sharing with you today, that this will help you in the work as you go forward as professionals and in the work that you do. So I say miigwech for chamiigwech for inviting me and to sharing a little bit that I know and I, and I wish you luck and have fun on, on this uh, uh, biodiversity and this group that you're, this conference that you're participating in webinar. Now miigwech, miigwech. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to a decade of biodiversity, successes and challenges in biodiversity education and awareness. This morning, there are going to be two speakers, Sandra Johnson with the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, and myself, JC Moore, with the Biodiversity Education and Awareness Network. Biodiversity education and awareness continues to be a crucial importance on a local, provincial, national, and international scale. For this reason, an education and awareness task team was created. 
the Biodiversity Education and Awareness Network, or BEAN for short. BEAN's priorities are based off of targets and goals in Ontario's biodiversity strategy from 2011. This session is going to explore the successes and challenges of communicating biodiversity with a discussion of how these efforts can be improved in the future. Throughout this seminar or this session, please direct any questions you have for Sandra and myself into the chat, and we'll hopefully have enough time at the end to answer them all. I will start off by introducing myself, and then I will let uh, Sandra introduce herself. Um, so my passion for the outdoors and Ontario plant species led me to study ecological restoration and achieve a Bachelor's of Science from Fleming College and Trent University. My role, I work at the Alderville Black Oak Savannah as the Garden and Outreach Coordinator, and I promote events and raise awareness of the Alderville Black Oak Savannah located on Alderville First Nation. I participate in developing programs for schools, post-secondary institutions, and visiting groups. Prior to joining the Alderville Black Oak Savannah team, I spent five years working for the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, where I provided instruction on fish and wildlife in Ontario and delivering conservation-based programming. Uh, outside my work with the Alderville Black Oak Savannah, I volunteer as the co-chair for the Biodiversity Education and Awareness Network, or BEAN. Uh, and I also enjoy fishing, hunting, camping, and drinking coffee. Uh, I truly hope that you all enjoy this presentation and the rest of the summit. And I'm going to pass it over to Sandra. Hi, thanks, JC. Um, so I think I will um, just go ahead and begin my presentation, if that's OK. Uh, let me just pick here. Okay, can you see that okay, just checking? Yeah, I see your presentation there, Sandra. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, JC. Uh, um, I'm really excited to hear about BEAN. I know that there's been a lot of great work underway in terms of progress toward the 2020 biodiversity targets. Um, and thank you for asking me to be here today. I'm thrilled to be able to share some of the work of the Ontario Biodiversity Council. Um, so hello everybody, as JC mentioned, my name is Sandra Johnson and I'm a policy advisor with the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. I work in the Biodiversity and Invasive Species section, which is in the Fish and Wildlife Policy Branch. And a large part of my role in policy development is communications. So I've had the opportunity of crafting messages and thinking of ways to communicate our policies and the work that we do. I've been with the uh, ministry for over 10 years now, um, and I've had the opportunity in my career to work with organizations such as BEAN, um, so I really appreciated the passion and some of the projects that we've worked on. Um, in my personal life, I am a mom to two twin boys. They're seven years old, and so we love the outdoors and we love to get outside um, and explore nature, and it's really great to see it uh, through their eyes. So. Um, biodiversity is very important to me and my family. So in my career, I also have the opportunity of working with the Ontario Biodiversity Council, and I've done so for over 10 years now. So I'm really pleased to be here and share some of that work. So a brief overview, um, a brief overview of some of the things that I want to talk to you about today. Um, firstly, I'll provide um, an overview of Council and some of the great work that they do. Then we'll take a look at some of the importance of biodiversity and the work that's been done to grow awareness. Um, I have some really neat statistics that were used in developing Council's indicator on biodiversity awareness. So I'll show you some of those highlights and we'll walk through that survey. Then we'll take a look at a report that Council had done that provides an in-depth look at common communication challenges, approaches, and recommendations when, effective, when crafting effective messaging. Throughout the presentation, I would also like to do a little interactive um, uh, Mentimeter if I can. Uh, so I'd like to be posing some questions to you, to you in the audience. We'll be using a service called Mentimeter. So when the time comes, I'll give you the website and the presentation code and you're welcome to join in. Um, just you can open another tab in your browser or you can join uh, through your phone uh, if you would like to participate. Absolutely not mandatory. I just thought it might be something fun to do. 
So a quick overview, as I mentioned, of the Ontario Biodiversity Council um, to complement what Steve Hounsel, the chair of council, provided in the opening remarks. Uh, the first uh, Ontario's biodiversity strategy had, had an action to create a network of conservation-minded uh, individuals to guide the implementation of the strategy. And the current Ontario Biodiversity Council is this action. It's grown and it continues to grow with now 38 active members. One of those members is the Government of Ontario, represented by the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, which is where myself and my colleagues come in as we provide secretariat support. Summer Council's achievements to date include the interim report on Ontario's biodiversity in 2008. This was a look at the, uh, the first OBS, Ontario's Biodiversity Strategy, implementation within its first three years. Uh, their Council released the State of Ontario's Biodiversity 2010 report and an OBS progress report from 20, 2005 to 2010. And it's important to note the State of Biodiversity report in 2010 was the first ever of its kind for the province and it offers a look at the health of biodiversity based on at that time 29 indicators of assessment. It has grown. Council undertook the renewal of Ontario's biodiversity strategy 2011 to 2020 and in 2015 Council hosted the first ever biodiversity summit and at that time released the second State of Ontario's Biodiversity 2015, and we switched to a dynamic online reporting tool. So I would encourage everybody to check out the State of Ontario's Biodiversity website, which is sober.ca. Council continues this great work with efforts like today, the second Biodiversity Summit. So I think that we can all agree biodiversity is very important and I'm sure that this audience, if you've dialed in today, will be very familiar with why biodiversity is so important. We know about the fundamental role it plays in our health and our well-being, the services that it provides for our everyday lives, clean air and water, climate regulation, recreation opportunities and many others. Understanding and appreciating biodiversity is very relevant to today, now more than ever, as we are amidst a global pandemic, as you know, over a year now. And people are appreciating green spaces, the outdoors, and the recreational opportunities that they provide. I'm gonna talk a little bit later in this presentation about a report that the council had done that lists a series of challenges, approaches, and recommendations for communicating biodiversity and climate change that are widely effective. And there's one paragraph in that report that really resonates with me, so I'd actually like to start by sharing that. So it says, slowing the pace of climate change won't be accomplished in one fell swoop with one simple action. It will require changes in government policy, new approaches to urban planning, citizen action, and thousands of tiny changes to everyday habits. And this is a sentiment, something that the Ontario Biodiversity Council has been encouraging all along. And we often state that we all have a role to play. So as I mentioned, it may seem obvious to us uh, the importance of biodiversity, and maybe we've seen that awareness has grown, especially in the last year, as people, as I mentioned, head to the outdoors with a rekindled passion for nature. But do we think that people really know that what they are enjoying is biodiversity and why it's so important? Earlier, I mentioned the renewed Ontario's biodiversity strategy, and that is a document created by the Ontario Biodiversity Council for the people of Ontario. It has a specific target, and that's target two, that says by 2015, 50% of Ontarians understand biodiversity and its role in maintaining our health and well-being. I'm going to talk a little bit about that target and how we are doing. So how could we measure awareness in Ontario? Our approach to this indicator started back in 2014. The Canadian Nature Survey was showing that 71% of the Ontario respondents had heard of the term biodiversity. This was a nationwide survey, but the Ontario specific data was extracted and shared. And this was really good news for Council. Uh, we wanted to uh, have a more precise measurement of awareness and understanding to have results that could be connected and used to report on our target too. So Council initiated their own survey series in Ontario, asking more detailed questions. They commissioned phone surveys in October 2014 and in 2016, and then again in January 2020. And I will be sharing those results with you. 
Before I get to the results of the questions, it's important to note OBC is not considering that we are solely responsible for the increase in awareness. We all have a role to play, as I mentioned earlier, and Council is able to do its part through things like social media, conferences, partnerships, and other communication streams to aid in this increase in awareness. In fact, since 2005, council member organizations have delivered many, many programs, events, and activities that support biodiversity communication, education, and awareness throughout Ontario. This includes events and activities that have made connections to all audiences and segments of society, and including landowners, children and youth, urban, rural, business, and educators. Individually and collectively, actions like this have increased our awareness and our understanding about biodiversity and its importance to our health and well-being. And I think JC will talk about some of this work as well when she speaks to other targets within the Ontario Biodiversity Strategy during her presentation. So now that we have three surveys under our belt, we can look at results over time and we have some really positive trend analysis that I can share. We've also increased our respondents. In 2014 and 2016, we reached 1,000 people through the survey. In 2020, our survey sample was increased to 1,500. And now we'll take a look. So looking first um, at the 2020 study sample, specifically a breakdown by area, you can see here that Toronto and the GTA represent 40% of respondents. And this sample reflects the distribution of population across Ontario. So before we get to uh, the first question in the survey, I'm gonna stop here for a Mentimeter question. Participation, as I mentioned, is not mandatory at all, and it will be totally anonymous. In this case, for the question I'm asking, there is a right answer, but I will have no way to know who guessed right and who guessed wrong. Um, in fact, anyone that does follow Council on our social media accounts, Facebook and Instagram, may already have the answer to this because we posted about it yesterday. So I'm gonna end my show and hopefully, this will be displaying my Mentimeter. Oh, great, somebody is already putting in answers. So I'm asking you, what percentage of respondents to the 2020 survey were aware of the word biodiversity? So I'm just gonna give people a couple minutes to get set up. Go to menti.com and you can see the code when prompted, 932-38808 and you should have the four um, possible answers there and just pick which one you think. I'll give people a couple time, a couple minutes to go check out our social media because I just gave away the answer that it's there. Okay, I think everybody's locked in their final answers and it looks as though the majority is thinking that 74% of Ontario's, oh, a couple more coming in. Okay, so we're still at 74% of the audience think that, uh, or sorry, uh, 10 people in our audience think that 74% of Ontarians understood the term biodiversity. Oh, now we're up to 11. That's fantastic, thank you. So um, I'm going to go back to my slide here and let's see what the answer is. So right off the bat, participants were asked, are you aware of the term biodiversity? And this was asked to everybody and happy to report that 74% of participants said yes. So for anyone that guessed that in the Menti question, great job, gold stars all around. So looking at this answer, you can see the trend upward, which is fantastic. And we can break this down a bit and see that the awareness level seemed to change depending on the age of the participants. Younger respondents between the ages of 18 to 24 were most aware of the term. Then the 25 to 34 year olds, which was closely followed by the 35 to 44. The awareness levels also changed depending on region. Awareness levels were highest in the GTA and the city of Toronto. But the key takeaway here is that 74% of respondents were familiar with the term, and that's a 14% increase from 2014, which means awareness is growing over time and we are definitely heading in the right direction. The next question that we asked respondents was, which of the following definitions best fit your understanding of biodiversity? And this was asked only to the 74% of respondents that had answered yes to our first question. They were first read a series of five definitions and were asked to name which ones 
which one best fit their understanding of the term biodiversity, and only one could be chosen. Results have been consistent over the three survey years, with variety of life being named most often at 61%, and this is also an increase of 3% since 2016. The environment and nature was next most recalled by 13%. We also asked, have you used the word biodiversity in a conversation with your friends, family, or coworkers? For the 2020 survey, 45% said yes to this question, which is a 12% increase from 2016. We were able to break that out by age as well, and younger respondents aged 18 to 24 represented 59% uh, answering yes to this question, followed by 25 to 34 aged uh, with 53%. Then in an open-ended probe allowing for one top of mind verbatim response, the 74% of respondents that were aware of the term biodiversity were then asked how they first learned of the word. This is where we start to see some shifts in how biodiversity communication is happening. No surprises that school was named the number one source at 25%. However, this is down 5% from 2016. And what you can't see here is that it ranked 44% of those in the 18 to 24 age range. Social media followed at 15% overall, which is a 13% increase from 2016. And broken down by age, that represents a rank of 48% with people aged 25 to 34 and 32% with people aged 18 to 24. Television was named by 14%, newspapers by 13%, and you can see here the other mentions included just reading about it, environmental events, internet websites, through acquaintances, conservation authorities, and radio. In an open-ended probe allowing for one verbatim response, the 74% of respondents that were aware of the term biodiversity were then asked where they get their biodiversity information. Internet websites were found to be the main source by which respondents attain information at 35%, and that's up 3% from 2016. Again, you can't see it here, but I do have the breakout um, by age, and this was up especially among, among the 18 to 24 year olds, ranking number one with 49%. And social media now follows in second at 11%, which is up 8%, with the highest recall among those aged 25 to 34. Uh, you can see here newspapers were cited by 8%, TV is coming in at 6%, as well as books, science or environmental experts at 5%, and word of mouth is at 4%. So then in an open-ended probe allowing for one verbatim response, which uh, respondents were asked, which source of information do you think is the most influential to educate Ontarians about biodiversity? Not really a surprise here that school or formal education is still seen by most at 33% as the most influential, although the numbers have dropped by 2% compared to 2016 and they're down 5% since 2014. In at a close and consistent 31% are internet websites. And as I mentioned previously, there has been a sharp increase in the number of Ontarians that have named social media at 21%, which has jumped 17% over 2016, which is a bit of the trend that we've been seeing over the last couple slides. The percentage that named television and newspapers uh, continues to drop. All respondents were then uh, asked to recall the age range that they felt it would be most important to educate Ontarians about biodiversity in order to improve awareness. They were read the ranges and asked to choose their preference. Most Ontarians believe that in order to advance awareness, awareness of biodiversity, residents under the age of 18 need to be educated. This includes 44% that stated the age cohort of 12 to 17 years of age, and 39% uh, picking ages under 12. There were 14% that mentioned the 18 to 24 year olds and only 1% for each of the 25 to 40 and the 40 to 59 year olds, while nobody named the ages over 60. 
So we are fairly aware of the threats to biodiversity. Um, they're rather well known and they've been identified in Ontario's biodiversity strategy. This next question we're asking about general awareness of these threats. All respondents were read a list of issues and were then asked which one they felt was the most important one affecting the biodiversity of the province. Climate change is now seen as the most important issue facing Ontario's biodiversity by 28%. That's a 16% increase compared to 2016. Pollution and pesticides follow at 18%, followed by habitat loss and the unsustainable use of resources, both consistent but down 2% over the 2016 results. And you can see here other mentions include population growth and invasive species. Next, all respondents were read the statement, biodiversity plays an important role in maintaining health and well-being. A total of 82% surveyed agreed or strongly agreed that biodiversity does play an important role in maintaining their health and well-being, a 4% increase over 2016. Only 3% disagreed or do not feel it plays an important role. 12% were neutral and 3% did not know. In a final semi-open-ended question, all respondents were read a list of aspects of biodiversity and were then asked which one they felt had the greatest impact on their health. Cleaner air and water are still the most named areas where Ontarians feel that biodiversity has the greatest impact on their individual health at 47%, and this is up 7% compared to 2016. Healthy food was the next one with 16%. Climate regulation followed at 12% in 2020, and that's a 4% increase over 2016. So that's a look at the questions that we asked through our survey and the responses that were given. Um, so we are asking now, how does biodiversity rank on a global scale? In this map, you can see how biodiversity awareness levels compare to awareness levels reported between 2012 and 2020 for select countries around the world. And as we found out earlier, Ontario is at 74%. One note I would like to make about this slide is that this map, the biodiversity barometer, is from the Union of Ethical Biotrade, or the UEBT. And the UEBT biodiversity barom barometer serves as one of the global indicators recognized by the Convention on Biological Diversity to track its IHE target, which is a global target, on people's biodiversity awareness around the world. When developing the questions for the, the council survey, we sought permission from the UEBT to adopt their questions for our purposes of Ontario surveying so that we were in line with awareness as it's measured on a global scale. So in summary, we have some very good news to report regarding awareness. In 2020, 74% of respondents were aware of the term biodiversity, and that represents a 14% increase over the 2014 survey. Of the respondents aware of biodiversity, 61% have defined it correctly, and another 30% chose a partial definition. 82% of the respondents agreed with the statement that biodiversity plays an important role in maintaining their health and well-being. In 2020, cleaner air and water was chosen as the aspect of biodiversity with the greatest impact on our human health. Climate change is now seen as the most important issue facing Ontario's biodiversity. That's by 28%, which is, as I mentioned, a 16% increase compared to 2016. And the survey results show that Ontarians' awareness about biodiversity and it's important to their health have reached the 50% target outlined in Ontario's Biodiversity Strategy 2011. We were starting from a very good place and we've continued to grow awareness and we're hopeful that we can continue to do so. So that is the results of the survey and a look at awareness in the province. I'm just gonna switch gears a little bit. And now that we have an understanding of awareness in Ontario, we'll look at ways to increase that awareness even more because when it comes to raising awareness, communication really is a key. We've seen an increasing interest in the two parallel crises of biodiversity loss and climate change. We've just seen this in the survey results. We've seen it among other indicators and science worldwide. And this led the Ontario Biodiversity Council to work to advance awareness and communication in this arena. The work of the council is guided by their strategic agenda, which as the name states, is a strategic plan created to direct 
Biodiversity Council priorities over the coming years. And for the time of 2016 to 2020, one of the focuses of the Council has been to increase efforts on the link between biodiversity and climate change, because after all, the diversity of life is our best defense in a world of rapidly changing climate. So in 2016, supported by and in collaboration with the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, the Ontario Biodiversity Council launched a project to examine approaches to communicating the relationship between biodiversity and climate change. We worked with a firm that helped us tackle four main objectives. That included jurisdictional scanning to look at the big picture of communication strategies and approaches for biodiversity and climate change. We held a workshop with communication professionals to brainstorm and share experiences and tools. We worked to define Ontario's audience and the best way to share information with them. And we worked to develop key messages that would resonate with that audience. The outcome was a guide of all the research and the lessons learned that can help anyone in crafting effective messaging. I'll walk you through some of the common communication challenges that we likely all face. We'll look at the results of the jurisdictional scanning that was done to see common approaches worldwide. The authors of the report have some really great recommendations that we can break down and look at, as well as developing those key messages and what to consider. This report is available on the Council's website in the spotlight area. So for more information and a PDF copy, please be sure to visit the website ontariobiodiversitycouncil.ca. So digging into the report, when it comes to communicating about biodiversity and climate change, there is a specific set of communication challenges that we often face. So the question really becomes, how do we engage and how do we motivate when we face these certain barriers? Well, if we break down the barriers, that can really help us understand. And what I'm referring to is message complexity, psychological distance, varying beliefs, and a disconnect between awareness and action. And so we're going to explore these a little bit. When I talk about complexity of messaging, I'm referring specifically in this case to biodiversity and climate change. But this really is a universal challenge. And sometimes, while concepts by themselves may be simple, in this case, biodiversity being all living things and how they are connected, and then there's climate change, which is significant changes in global temperature, precipitation, and other measures of climate that occur over time. Separately, these concepts, while complex, are fairly easy to understand. The challenge becomes when explaining the interrelated nature of biodiversity resilience and how it is affected by climate change, that can be very complex, and how biodiversity can be a defense against a changing climate. Without your audience truly understanding the issue and you not knowing how informed or maybe preconditioned your audience is, it can be tricky to engage and inspire people to act. The next challenge is what we call psychological distance. So we often define ourselves and the world around us through our own experiences. And in times we are the center of our own universe and we all do this and it doesn't make us selfish. It can, however, make it hard for us to conceptualize a danger or a risk when the threat appears far off into the future or not immediate. If it's not staring us right in the face, we can have a hard time visualizing those effects within our own core set of priorities. And for biodiversity and climate change, this really does present a challenge. Climate change and biodiversity loss, as I mentioned, two complex topics, can quite often be perceived as threats for the future only making any behavior change now rather difficult. Since we as humans, we do like to see immediate impact of our actions. The third challenge in the report is the idea of varying beliefs. And when it comes to climate change, I think we're all aware that there's a wide spectrum of belief and concern. And the amount of belief determines willingness and motivation to act. A recent study done through Yale has categorized a spectrum of just this and it ranges from what we call dismissive up to the alarmed. And where someone falls on that scale is an indication of how motivated they will be to act, least concerned being least motivated and most concerned or alarmed being the most motivated. Knowing where your audience falls on this spectrum can give you a starting point in identifying who to prioritize in your communications and who will dismiss your messaging no matter what. 
We're going to talk a little bit later about some approaches to these challenges in the upcoming slides. But believe it or not, an effective strategy is not to even try and reach that small percent of people that you know will completely dismiss your content. And the last challenge that we'll explore is the disconnect between awareness and action. And arguably, this disconnect between awareness and action can be one of the biggest challenges. I think we can agree that making people aware and educating them to the best of our ability is really important. But if you're not inspiring a direct action or promoting a behavior change, we're not likely to see the desired results. So we're gonna take another quick pause right here before moving on. And I'd like to go back to the Mentimeter. You shouldn't need to re-enter any of your information. And in a second, I'll switch over to the next question. And we're gonna build a word cloud. So I'll be asking you in a word or two, can you tell me what you think the biggest challenges to communicating biodiversity and climate change are? Or just biodiversity or just climate change or anything in between. It can be something that I've already spoke about, complexity or knowledge. Um, anything. You can have up to three answers. Um, and if you strongly agree with something that you see up there, enter it again and watch it grow. So I'll end that slide here. And I'll switch over. We should be seeing the next question. So we're going to build a word cloud. And just if you could let me know what you think the biggest challenge to communicating biodiversity and climate change is. Seeing some hmm. I am agreeing with all of these that are coming in. I think that's great. I like how they're they're growing. People are agreeing. I think we have some consensus here on misinformation, complexity, apathy. Agree. I completely agree. A good one there. Variety of terminology. That's right. Yeah, and that kind of just leads to some of that complexity as well. I'll just give a couple more seconds for anyone that wants to lock in their final answer. And I will leave that open when I go back to my PowerPoint, but I'm looking at apathy, misinformation, complexity, disconnect. Yep, definitely. And engagement. These are great. Very helpful. I love the stubbornness. That's great. Thank you. Thank you to everybody that participated. That's fantastic. I will leave that open, but I will I need to carry on here. Yeah, yeah, misinformation, big one. Thank you very much to uh, everybody. So it looks like we have misinformation and apathy, the disconnect, and I'm hoping that perhaps a look at some of the common approaches that I will carry forward with um, for tackling these challenges might be helpful. So we shall take a look. So moving on from those challenges, we'll dig a little bit deeper into the opportunities. As part of this project, the consultants reviewed a series of existing communications from a number of sources across a wide range of media, which was designed for varying audiences. They did a really great job at synthesizing that information, and it provided an in-depth look at common approaches to communicating about these issues on various levels, including scales, subjects, values, and perspectives. And we'll break those down a little bit. So the first one being scale, and we're talking micro or macro. And whether you're talking about backyard beekeeping or global CO2 levels, programs all have a scale. Before we can say anything, we need to define, define a scale or a scope at which we're speaking. This can be anything from the intimate individual micro scale up to the big picture global experience of the macro scale. Looking at the first image here, I pulled a few from the report, but this is a really great example of a macro campaign 
big picture, we are all wildlife. The next approach is looking at your subject, human or nature. Are we talking about the issue from the human perspective or is, this, is nature going to be the focus? If we are gonna frame our message to break down all the things that we love that are threatened by climate change and biodiversity loss, then the focus is on us and humans are the center of this issue. Or on the flip side, maybe the focus is on nature as the central part of our campaign, looking at issues like climate change from the environment's perspective. A great example of this in the report is from an organization called Conservation International, who developed a whole campaign with the key message, nature doesn't need people, we need nature. So these are two different ways of delivering that message and both can be uh, effective. So the third approach is value, intrinsic or utilitarian. How does the program define the value that nature has? Are we trying to get across a point that is relative to human need? Or is it about having some intrinsic value in and of itself, biodiversity for biodiversity's sake? Focusing on the innate value that we can all see for ourselves and have the privilege of experiencing. The Global Nature for All campaign by IUCN clearly links that nature has intrinsic values that we can all see for ourselves just by going outside and experiencing it. Or will we place the value in terms of resources and define nature's benefit in very practical terms with a focus on sustainability? The fourth approach is looking at motivation. And this is perspective uh, of loss versus a gain. This can be a tricky one and you have to know your audience and really what will resonate. It's a very effective way to battle the challenge that I mentioned earlier of awareness to action, noting that it does work best as long as the message is not threatening. Focusing on messages that portray that biodiversity loss is directly connected to you and your consumption patterns and your actions, that can resonate with a lot of people. That message of loss and having the power to change it. The paper towel example um, in this slide, the dispenser image above, represents a really good example of this in that every paper towel you pull from that dispenser clearly is depleting the resources used to supply it. This can lead to awareness to action. And that's a message of loss. On the opposite side, you can focus on gain, gain to the environment and gain to the consumer. There's a really great example of this approach as well in the report featuring a very popular laundry detergent that can be used in cold water. And their message is washing in cold water can contribute to energy savings. That is a message of gain. And depending on how driven your audience is, this can also lead to awareness to action. And the last approach that's outlined in the guide is the appeal, emotional and logical. Some of us are emotional and some of us are logical thinkers. There are ways to reach both. Something like nature and conservation can be a really easy tie to emotional understanding. Encouraging love and pride and where you live and your surroundings can really impact people to embrace what is around them and to protect it. And for those that are logical, try making the choice as simple as possible. Life is full of tough decisions. Choosing a future where nature is abundant, we have food on the table and we breathe clean air should not have to be a hard decision to make. Both an emotional and a logical approach can be very effective. So we've looked at the challenges now and we've looked at the common approaches worldwide. Let's cover some of the recommendations that came out of the report. The approaches we just went through uh, when looking at how to frame your message are all really great guides for what to consider. And the following recommendations show how to address the challenges we touched on earlier. We'll take a quick look at them and how and when to apply them. So the first recommendation is talk to those that will listen. Do you remember the scale that I referenced earlier? Those deniers who are least motivated to act up to the alarmed who are the most motivated? Well, speaking to those who are at least moderately accepting of the fact that climate change is occurring, regardless of their opinions about cause and severity, is the way to go. When we speak to those that are dismissive or doubtful, we need to accept that they are unlikely to be convinced to change their beliefs. 
We all want to engage all the people in all the things, but truth be told, not targeting that small percentage of deniers, as I mentioned earlier, will allow you to use more explicit messaging when you're developing your strategies, because you already know that your audience is at least willing to listen. Because remember, the least concerned are the least motivated to act. And that portion of the audience may not be a wise use of our communication budgets. You can still target the mid-range, who we like to call the disengaged, in hopes of moving them to engagement. That's a very valid approach. You can develop campaigns to nudge towards the cautious and the concerned. The second recommendation is to speak their language. And this again is talking about message complexity. In order to talk to those that are, who are willing to listen, we need to speak the language. This is really about creating simple messages about complex topics creatively. And you can do this through the use of metaphors, analogies, and references to existing social or cultural knowledge. This is where that scaled approach we talked about will come into play. This strategy works well when dealing with local knowledge and issues on the micro level scale. Also, speaking a common language and simple messaging can overcome some of that psychological distance as we discussed. When you boil it down to local issues where your audience can see the impact of their actions and the end game doesn't seem as far away or irrelevant to their own lives. The third recommendation is balancing fear with action. And I'm a very firm believer in this recommendation. And I'm not arguing that some successful campaigns that have been launched that use fear-based messaging, um, most notably the Surgeon General anti-smoking warning on all the cigarette packages, that is wildly effective. But sometimes fear-based messaging on its own can lead to hopelessness. It's really important to temper fear with hope and frame losses as avoidable or preventable through positive action. Think about the paper towel dispenser that I showed previously. You can still speak to the urgency of an issue without making your audience feel hopeless. And I know that in our field, that can be difficult. Often when we speak of conservation and our concerns, it is a message of loss. I do it too. Habitat loss, endangered species, fragmentation. And this isn't necessarily a bad thing. These are all true statements, but there is research that shows when people are presented with potential gain versus loss, they're more likely to act. Avoiding fear-based isn't the answer, but rather finding a balance. There is a difference in a message such as, if we don't act now, millions of species will disappear, versus if we act now, we will save millions of species from extinction. This message of positive gain can tackle both the psychological distance and the awareness to action as well. If people can see that their actions could make a positive impact that affects their current and their future situation, they can begin to feel hopeful. The next recommendation is encouraging love and pride. Love of nature is valuable, but pride in nature, as I've mentioned earlier, can be even more valuable as it encourages a sense of responsibility and stewardship. When we take pride in something, we feel connected because we, uh, it has become an integral part of our identity and then we want to take care of it. As mentioned earlier, we are the center of our own universe. So this can tackle that psychological distance challenge that we touched on. And the last recommendation is the awareness to action. Awareness to action is all about setting the context. Sometimes it can take a small nudge to move your audience from awareness to understanding and then to action. We need to give information at the right point in the decision journey to nudge them to make the right choices. So this becomes about using context of communication to encourage immediate action, catching people along that decision journey at the right time. To overcome this challenge of disconnect of awareness to action effectively, it helps to understand the current behavior and the behavior that we're trying to change. And there are different ways to go about this. You can make the change, of, you can make the change to wanted behavior easy, if you're trying to get people to lower their footprint or buy less packaged products, then maybe you promote local farmers markets, uh, you make them more centralized or easy to get to, to encourage locally sourced produce. Or you can make the current action, the unwanted behavior, harder or discouraging, such as adding a fee for said unwanted behavior where the wanted behavior is actually free.
So those were some of the recommendations from the report and factoring everything that we just explored about scale and challenges, approaches and recommendations, the next step is to develop key messages. Before we can begin developing this message, we need to establish a common understanding of effective communication. And effective communication really needs to be relevant to your audience. If a message isn't in some way relevant to the people who are consuming it, it is likely to be ignored. It needs to be easy to understand. If your message is overly complex or difficult to parse, it will be ignored. It needs to be memorable. If your audience can't recall what your message was hours, days, or weeks later, then it probably hasn't been very effective. And your message should elicit response. Your audience can respond to your message in many ways, be it through action, behavior change, or even echoing your message to other. Regardless, effective communication should elicit some sort of response. So for our project in particular, one of our proposed outcomes was a series of key messages. And taking into account our communication recommendations, each message follows a similar structure. And I'll show you the practical application in just a minute. But for our purposes, each key message makes a connection between biodiversity and our changing climate. It identifies a threat to biodiversity or an opportunity to improve biodiversity. It recommends an action or a behavior change which reduces this threat or enables this opportunity. And where possible, we've included supplementary or intriguing facts and statistics that relate to the message. And for our purposes, we had three broad outcomes for our communication goals. And this was protect, produce, and participate. Protect, as in protect existing biodiversity by reducing threats. Produce, as in encourage sustainable production and growth that enhances long-term resilience. And participate, encourage pride and responsibility for Ontario's biodiversity by communicating the easy everyday behaviors that the general public can change to make a difference. So looking at some examples, um, coming out of this project that we developed a social media campaign. And we can see here that there were several elements that we've just discussed uh, that were used. So right away, the hashtag biodiversity makes us instills a touch of pride. Ontario is beautiful and we have so much to offer and our biodiversity makes us unique. It makes us strong, it makes us healthy, it makes us happy. I could go on forever. I think that you get the point that that hashtag really resonates. And we chose to talk to those that will listen. Uh, let's motivate the ones that will act. So in the first example, biodiversity makes us safe. We balanced fear with action and we talked to those that would listen. Our climate is changing, flooding, extreme weather and drought are all very real. Let's share the message about the things that we can do now to help mitigate this and protect our wetlands and leave no trace on your next fishing, hunting or canoe trip. So clearly we're already talking to those that are already making use of our biodiversity and can appreciate it. The middle example, biodiversity makes us secure. Let's work to protect these beautiful wetlands that serve so many purposes, tackling the psychological distance and again, balancing fear with action that this is happening and we can fix it. And lastly, we created awareness to action, tackling the complexity of biodiversity benefits. Biodiversity makes us breathe easy. Simple messaging, trees help us breathe better. One large tree can supply a day's worth of oxygen for four people. There's that intriguing fun fact that we threw in. So plant one today, a simple act made easy and logical. And that's just three examples of where that type of messaging can go. I think you, you probably get the idea. But the point is, have fun with it, think outside the box, but keep it focused on an approach that will help you tackle the challenges that you can with the tools that you have. So that's all I have for today. I want to thank you again uh, for having me and thank you for hanging in with me through all of that. Uh, to know more about Ontario's biodiversity and the various indicators we use to assess the state of our biodiversity in Ontario, uh, please visit the State of Ontario's Biodiversity website, which is sober.ca. Indicators are updated as information becomes available. 
And throughout the summit, Council will be releasing indicators related to some of the future sessions, and all indicators will be compiled into a summary this fall. And that will have updates on indicators as well as progress on the 2020 uh, targets. And to download a copy of the report that we just looked through, please go to ontariobiodiversitycouncil.ca and you can download a copy of the PDF. There's even more information than what I covered. Um, it includes all kinds of examples and common approaches from around the world, measuring their effectiveness. There's also a, a more in-depth look at what we call the decision journey and how you can motivate change along that journey. Thank you so much, Sandra. That was Great. wonderful. I am a big fan of statistics. I don't know about the people watching, but I was very excited to see that um, school, internet uh, searches and social media are kind of becoming the way that um, people are learning about biodiversity and getting outside and doing citizen science with uh, tools that aren't very expensive. You can just download apps. Um, so what we are going to do is we're going to take a quick um, 10 minute break. Uh, and so feel free to stick around. We're gonna show a, I think a seven minute YouTube video. Um, so feel free to stick around for that, grab a coffee, go to the washroom, and then we'll get started uh, in about 10 minutes. And I'm going to take a deep dive into um, target number one, which was um, getting biodiversity into elementary, secondary, post-secondary, and schools of business um, to further that biodiversity education. So we'll get Mike to queue up that video, and uh, we'll see you back in about 10 minutes, everybody. Thanks, everybody.
Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Hope you had a good quick break. Um, so I am going to dive deep into uh, my presentation here. And again, feel free if you have any questions for Sandra or myself, um, you can add them into the chat and we'll hopefully get to them at the end. Um, so welcome to the second presentation of a decade of biodiversity, uh, the biodiversity and education, biodiversity education and awareness network or BEAN for short. So um, today's presentation is gonna cover a couple topics. So I'm also going to mention the Ontario Biodiversity Council in a brief timeline, very similar to what Sandra went over, um, but we're just going to go over it again to really solidify kind of those key actions that occurred um, to, to get us where we are today. Um, I'm also gonna talk about the history of being, what is biodiversity on a very simple scale and where is it primarily found in the curriculum, Ontario's curriculum. I'm also going to introduce and share a little bit about BEAN's board members and some of the programs and organizations that um, are part of BEAN's members. Um, I'm also going to talk about our methods of public engagement through social media, blog, outdoor children's charter, step outside guide, kind of all those tools and resources we offer to the public and educators. Um, I'm going to talk about successes, challenges, and progress of each key target that we um, are working to address. And I'm overall going to look at the targets achieved in the past decade, where we didn't quite meet targets and why. And I'm going to have a, key, a few uh, improvements for the next decade. So very briefly, this is again kind of very similar to what Sandra covered. So in 2005, the Ontario government made a strong commitment to biodiversity conservation in Ontario through the development of Ontario's first biodiversity strategy. So that strategy concluded that the protection and sustainable use of biodiversity is a shared responsibility for all Ontarians, not just government or political um, figures. So it's really something that all of us need to uh, take into consideration. We need to work on and we need to work together. Um, so four working groups were then developed. The Ontario Biodiversity Council, who's hosting the summit, is one of them. The Biodiversity Education and Awareness Network, or BEAN, uh, Stewardship Network of Ontario, and the Ontario Biodiversity Science Forum. So these four working groups were made as kind of a task force to address the targets from the strategy. The council then released an interim report, kind of a summer, summary to address where we're at and looking to renew a strategy. And if we've achieved some of the targets over the past, uh, from the past strategy, and of course, areas of improvement. In 2010, the council then released the first ever State of Ontario's Biodiversity Report, 2010, uh, and the Ontario Biodiversity Strategy Progress Report. And then the council renews the strategy within Ontario's biodiversity strategy in 2011. And as Sandra mentioned, um, we are going to have a new um, uh, strategy uh, in the fall um, for 2021. So the purpose of Ontario's biodiversity strategy is to provide guidance and a common focus for biodiversity conservation. Uh, in Ontario amongst many different groups of people. Now that's going to involve stakeholders, not-for-profit organizations, Indigenous communities, uh, government-funded organizations, just to name a few. Ontario's biodiversity strategy from 2011 is the guiding framework for coordinating the conservation of our province's rich variety of life and ecosystems. It builds on the positive achievements of the 2005 strategy and sets out new and updated direction uh, and targets for the next 10 years. So arriving in 2021, like Sandra mentioned, a new strategy will be released. Uh, this is what we are celebrating with this summit. And this is our second uh, summit with the Biodiversity Council. So the objective of each of the strategies are A, Ontario has a strong foundation of policy and legislation to conserve biodiversity, and B, responsibility for the conservation of biodiversity is fully recognized and accepted by all. And this is kind of more of the side that I'm going to be speaking to um, in my presentation. It's kind of getting the word out, making sure um, that everyone is educated and is understanding and accepting that we all need to take action. And the strategy was divided into 15 key actions. 
So Bean as a working group was created to focus generally on key actions numbers one to three. So these three actions include continuing to integrate biodiversity education into all levels and types of curricula. So that's Bean's main focus. Um, employ strategies to effectively communicate relevance of biodiversity to the public. So that was what Sandra really spoke to this morning. And then three, develop and implement a children's outdoor bill of rights, um, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit. So mainly uh, one and three. So Sandra mainly spoke to, to the key action number two or the target number two. So one of Bean's main goals is to create free, easily accessible biodiversity-based lesson plans. And there's activities for parents as well. You don't have to be a teacher or an educator across a variety of subjects and grades. And we also share relevant educational content on social media accounts and in our blog. So as a collaborative, collaborative network or of organizations, Bean hosts a hub of resources for from board members and partners on our website. And just a note, we are constantly working on the website and adding to it. So if you go to a page and maybe don't see um, a lot of content, we are um, working away at the website. Uh, and we also share these resources to help enhance biodiversity learning in and outside of the classroom. So like I said, there are activities for parents to do with your kids at home. Um, if you just want to learn about a couple of key aspects of biodiversity, you're able to um, check out those resources as well. You don't have to be a teacher or an educator to use these resources and they are free. So to address uh, that key action of getting biodiversity into the curriculum, even though biodiversity as a concept or as a term isn't formally introduced until grade six or about the age 11, um, where it has its actual own unit, which is interesting that Sandra's statistics say that people generally um, think that we should be educating youth from I think it was 12 to 18 about biodiversity. So this is around age 11 where it's formally introduced as a topic or as a unit. And every, but every grade has a curriculum unit that connects to biodiversity in some way. So examples are grade one or about age six is the needs and characteristics of living things. Uh, grade three has a unit that's growth and changes in plants and a unit of soils in the environment, um, all the way to grade seven, interactions in the environment. So this is just a small snapshot of the connections to biodiversity in the science curriculum specifically uh, for grades one to 10. However, there are connections to biodiversity in many other subjects and higher grade levels too as well. Um, and each of these curriculum topics, each of these squares on this diagram has a couple, like several pages in the curriculum of learning objectives, terminology, examples for activities, um, things that all those students have to understand and they have to be taught. Um, so there are resources available to help you teach or learn about these subjects at every grade level and Bean is here to help provide educators and parents um, with those resources. So like I mentioned, our, one of our main focuses is to develop easily accessible, attractive, easy to follow, free lesson plans to help um, learn about biodiversity, again, in and outside of the classroom. So we create these biodiversity-based lesson plans across a variety of subjects and grades. So we even have lesson plans that target um, the math curriculum specifically and students calculate the rapid spread of invasive species. So we work really hard um, to connect um, all subjects to a theme of biodiversity in some way so that it's not just the science curriculum because there's links to biodiversity in, in arts, there's links in math, in English, and social studies. Um, so it's very important. Uh, so we also share relevant educational content like I said, on our social media accounts and our blog. Um, so definitely somewhere to check out. Le these lesson plans are created by board members. Some are certified teachers. Uh, I helped develop the two that are on this picture here. And I'm not a certified teacher, but we do have some on, on our board. Um, and that's just to ensure that they follow the curriculum. Um, so we, we have these lesson plans. They have the curriculum connections, but any, anyone can use them. The Ontario Backyard Birds one and the Let's ID That Tree, they 
are very citizen science focused. So they kind of help walk you through um, using Tree B, which is a Forest Ontario program to learn tree identification and um, learning about your Ontario's backyard birds through citizen science programs as well. So Bean is also working towards becoming a hub of other biodiversity resources, uh, and that can be utilized by teachers, families, individuals, and help direct folks to other biodiversity-focused groups that may not be on the Bean board. Uh, for example, community science or citizen science is becoming an increasingly popular way for everyone to get out and explore nature and contribute to science via databases like iNaturalist or Marlin Bird ID or the Ontario Reptile and Amphibian Atlas. And we want to make understanding these apps, projects, and biodiversity as a whole as easy as possible to get more and more people involved and in touch with nature and hopefully get those stats that Sandra talked about up to 100%. Uh, so these lesson plans are short, easy to follow. So you teachers and parents, you don't need to do more work uh, than you need. And we have a lot of older lesson plans with Bean that are quite hefty documents. So we're working to kind of revamp, go through, pick out the good content and make them kind of in like a one or two pager um, so that it's, it's nice and condensed and easy to follow. Uh, for older students and teachers, the blog has a great list of biodiversity related stories and resources and connections. And we also try to utilize our network as much as we can to assist folks who might have questions um, about biodiversity or who want to be involved in projects in the province but really don't know where to start. So we want to act as that resource hub as well. So I want to focus a little bit of time on our, on our network. So I work for the Alderville Black Oak Savannah, uh, but the network is full of another other amazing um, organizations. Um, so we're made up of many provincial organizations, each with a special connection to biodiversity and their own resources available. So that own special connection to biodiversity is very important to make a really solid, strong network. Um, we have like the Black Oak Savannah is a grassland. We have components from the Invasive Species Center. Forest Ontario is obviously a forest focus. Um, emerging leaders for biodiversity, they're very focused on allowing and helping um, people that want to involve, like get involved in the environmental career, kind of how to start, ways to build yourself up as a candidate. Um, the Hunting and Fishing Heritage Center has a focus from hunting and fishing on biodiversity. And there's just a really great network of people that have their own unique connection, but we all have a common goal, uh, which is quite beautiful. So these are the board's current members, and these organizations have changed over the years. Uh, we also have members in our Greater Bean Network, such as EcoSpark, who don't actively sit on the board and participate in meetings, uh, but we, they work with us on, a, on an activity by activity basis, and they, we cross promote materials with each other and collaborate on programs. Um, the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry oversees beans activities and provides guidance and con, uh, connections where needed as well. So as a collaborative uh, network of organizations, we host a hub of resources from these board members and partners on our website to help enhance biodiversity learning across the province. So I'm gonna do a quick deep dive into um, each of those um, members and kind of what they have to offer. So our network includes organizations like Forest Ontario who host a collection of free educational resources called Focus on Forests. Uh, they provide lesson plans, study guides, activities, fact sheets, presentations, and more to help teachers and uh, parents, any type of educator, bring forestry uh, to you and learn more about it. They also spearhead the Envirothon um, uh, program, uh, which is a team-based high school program that challenges high school age students to learn more about the natural world around them. Uh, this is very fun. I actually got to participate one year um, because one of the themes that they focus on is wildlife. Um, and when I worked for the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters at the Hunting and Fishing Heritage Center, uh, I got to actually run the wildlife booth um, and, and teach these high school students competing in the Envirothon um, about Ontario's wildlife. So that was a very nice connection to that program. So the Hunting and Fishing Heritage Center is, or HFHC, is part of the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, or the OFAH. 
uh, and focuses on conservation education and providing youth with opportunities to get outdoors and learn more about the nature around you. Um, the Heritage Centre showcases Canada's landscapes and the wildlife with diorama displays and has a large amphitheater, archery, air gun ranges and a fishing pond, making it a popular field trip destination and it's located in Peterborough. Um, so we have, there's like an Arctic exhibit, a West Coast exhibit, Northern Ontario exhibit, Southern Ontario exhibit, each with their own um, mounted real animals. They're all real and taxidermied. So it's quite a wonderful place to visit. Um, the HFHC is offering virtual lessons through their YouTube channel about Ontario's fish and wildlife. Um, two lessons are posted each week, one for uh, kindergarten to grade three and one for grade four to eight. And um, teachers specifically who are watching these as their class have the option to book free live question and answer sessions with an Heritage Center educator uh, based on these videos. And these programs will actually be highlighted in a video released in the August Prioritizing Biodiversity Education in a Changing World uh, Summit session. So if you're interested in learning more about uh, this program specifically, definitely sign up for that session. Um, they're gonna, it's gonna be a video released in, in August. So the Emerging Leaders in Biodiversity Network connects young professionals with opportunities to get hands-on experience, share knowledge, and preserve the natural environment. They are another group, working group of the Ontario Biodiversity Council. Uh, they have a mentorship program and students are encouraged to join their Facebook group, sign up for their newsletter, follow social media. Um, and ELB is in the midst of their second season of a podcast titled How Do I Do This? An Environmental Career Podcast, which may be of interest to any uh, kids that might be watching or parents if you want to share that. Um, kind of a kickstart their um, potential career in, in, in the environmental field. Um, and this is kind of how ELB adapted to the pandemic, which I think is very cool to create a podcast. Um, so pre-pandemic, ELB hosted capacity building workshops to help you get the skills you need to excel. And they're actually offering other sessions throughout the summit. So if you wanna learn more, um, check out some other summit sessions from the Emerging Leaders in Biodiversity. Ontario Nature is a conservation organization that protects wild species and spaces through conservation, education, and public engagement. Ontario Nature's citizen science program relies on nature enthusiasts like you to help us better understand the wild species and spaces across the province. You can observe wild plants and animals to help to identify, monitor populations, track species distributions, spatial trends over time, and this knowledge actually strengthens conservation efforts. Um, because it's very challenging to have um, a biologist or a scientist out uh, collecting the volume of data that we collect from volunteers and citizen science scientists. Um, the Nature Guardians Youth Program also brings youth together through nature-based experiences and leadership opportunities to inspire and grow the next generation of conservation leaders in Ontario. We also have the Invasive Species Center, who has been very heavily involved in um, the creation of this summit. So a big thank you to them. Uh, the Invasive Species Center helps to prevent the introduction and spread of high risk invasive species in Canada by connecting stakeholders with knowledge and technology. Incorporated as a not-for-profit in 2011, the Invasive Species Center is a hub for collaboration and knowledge sharing. And the center is a respected partner and leader in invasive species science, education, and action. They have many teaching resources on their website, which includes lesson plans, as well as an introduction to invasive species video for, for classes and um, anyone wanting to learn more. Their all, webinar series also may be of interest to you. And students can also, or youth or anyone, can also participate in the Early Detection and Rapid Response Network uh, Community Citizen Science Program. And this program will actually be shared through a video in the July Community Science uh, Summit session as well. So the Alderville Black Oak Savannah offers, um, so just my slide there. The Alderville Black Oak Savannah offers three different program streams. The first is Where Fires Dance, which is a Esri story map presentation of the Alderville Black Oak Savannah. The class will uh, explore and understand the connections between Anishinaabe culture, fire, tall grass ecosystems, 
and these ecosystems are unique and contain rare flora and fauna and incorporate traditional ecological knowledge in all aspects of restoration. We have another program um, that's called Where Is All the Grassland Gone? And this is a learning opportunity where uh, students can get a class set of books called Where Fires Dance, uh, which is about the Black Oak Savannah and some of the wildlife and plants that you might find here. Um, students will also receive a seed packet of native grassland plants to spread in a green space. Um, and teachers will get access to a native plant identification tool to ID some native grassland plants. Uh, in your backyard. So the um, this program will also be highlighted in a video released in August, again, in the Prioritizing Biodiversity Education in a Changing World uh, Summit session. So if you want to also learn more about those programs. And then EcoSpark, like I mentioned, is one of our Greater Bean Network members. They offer many wonderful resources and their program will be shared um, in a video in July through the Community Science Summit session, featuring programs like Get Outside with School Watch, Caterpillars Count, and more. So definitely sign up for that session for a video from them as well. So Bean has many methods of public engagement, mostly social media, Facebook. Um, we have both opened and closed groups, but the closed group you can just ask to join. Um, Bean's blog is on the website, and it's often written by members of the Bean board and others willing to submit a blog post. So if any of you work for an environmental organization or have something interesting you'd like to share, uh, you can email the Bean email. Um, and uh, we can try to get it up on the blog. Um, it provides resources and stories for the public to participate in biodiversity events or learn more about biodiversity topics. The Children's Outdoor Charter was created to address target number three, if you remember, um, to uh, um, develop and implement a Children's Outdoor Bill of Rights. And this is an activity guide available to everyone. Uh, a list of activities every Ontario child has the right to experience, like swim in a lake and go fishing. When Bean was originally created, we received funding from the government to develop and translate resources, attend outreach events, and award micro grants up to $500 for biodiversity related events and projects within the province. Uh, many of these grants were awarded to teachers to run biodiversity education days at their school or implement projects like creating pollinator gardens. Other projects that were awarded were things like invasive species poll days and other fun outreach events. Uh, but unfortunately, in 2018, we received a complete cut to our funding, but there certainly are other opportunities available in the province to apply for grants for your own projects. So Bean remains as active um, as a dedicated group of volunteers and continues to create these resources for educators. So we are a full um, volunteer base over here. Um, so our social media and Facebook pages, like I mentioned, you are welcome to ask to join the closed one or there's an open one um, where many other environmental educators and professionals share information and resources. Um, our website is biodiversityeducation.ca, and this is where we host the resources, blog, and other content for you to check out. Um, this is a quick snapshot of the website for the Outdoor Children's Charter. It's a great activity guide for the year. Um, it has activities that you would do all throughout the year, like build a snow fort or go swim in a lake. Um, to get outside with your class or your kids um, and do some exploring. And like I said before, that was to address uh, key action number three. Um, this is some information about the grants when we were able to um, award them. We were doing them from 2012 to 2018. So May 22nd is the International Day of Biodiversity. So we just passed it. Um, but each year, Bean would give away micro grants for events or projects taking place in May that had a focus on biodiversity to um, honor this International Day of Biodiversity on May 22nd. Um, so we had about $10,000 that we would um, give out to about 25 to 30 um, applicants each year, uh, depending on the, the ask that some of them had. Um, it was up to $500. Um, and we would have many, many applicants. Unfortunately, in 2018, we had 79 applicants and we were only able to award 27. Um, and that was, 
that was our, our budget. And then the following year, um, we were unable to give any money for grants. So uh, we had a lot of people reaching out saying, when are they opening? When are they opening? So it's unfortunate that we had that momentum and we had a continue continuous growth in 2012 we had 38 applicants in 2018 we had 79 almost 80 so um, we did have that really great momentum so hopefully we'll be able to offer those one day again soon and i like to show this um, this is a like a brochure we'd bring to outreach events to show um, the idb grant so international day of biodiversity idb um, so we actually had um, many different participants and projects funded in different parts of the province. So Northern Ontario, we had about seven projects funded and almost 400 participants. Um, whereas down in Southwestern Ontario, uh, we had 16 projects funded and almost 8,000 participants. And South Central Region, 50 projects funded and almost 9,000 participants. So um, the, the grants were really reaching a lot of great biodiversity-based programs. So into the 2005 strategy, these there were three ways on how the progress would be measured for the key actions one to three. Um, so like Sandra spoke about in the 2015 summary report, uh, this progress was included. There was a substantial progress in integrating uh, elementary biodiversity into elementary and secondary schools, substantial progress in um, 50% of Ontarians understanding the term biodiversity, um, which that makes sense, as Sandra mentioned, it was at 74%, uh, and some progress in participating in biodiversity conservation activities. So keep in mind these numbers um, are from a couple of years ago, so I hope and I believe that these numbers have increased, um, and we will, we will see that in the, the 2021 strategy uh, being released in the fall. I do believe one of the main challenges with incorporating biodiversity into the curriculum is the Ontario government curriculum we are currently using in 2021 is actually still the 2007 curriculum. So um, this was published in 2007 and the strategy was initiated in 2005. So I feel um, like this needs to be uh, revise and incorporate input from environmental educators um, to make sure that we're addressing and educating those important concepts at an appropriate age um, because these targets and topics, not all of them that are really important, were able to be integrated into the, the curriculum. In the School of Business, um, it's pretty much at the discretion, from what I understand, I did not go to business school, but it's pretty much at the discretion of the, the professor and the, the head of the department to um, check off the lessons and the syllabus. So sometimes it might be challenging to incorporate lessons of biodiversity into the school of business if this is something new that's expected of an educator, uh, which is a big part of what Bean hopes to accomplish is, is help educators that maybe don't have the background in biodiversity or biology um, to, to kind of learn those terms and those concepts. Uh, lesson plans are as easy to follow as possible. So we're currently revamping and edit, editing many lesson plans to make sure they're nice and simple and easy to follow. Um, another challenge is people on the Bean board, like I mentioned, are all voluntary. So um, myself included, without funding, it's all volunteer led, which makes it challenging to accomplish goals like getting our lesson plans translated. We were able to have all of our lesson plans translated into French. Um, when when Bean's lesson plans were starting to be developed in its infancy um, and we're unable to do that now without a volunteer to do the translating for us. Um, some of the challenges with target number three, the Children's Outdoor Bill of Rights, is ge ge geography. Um, these activities can be quite hard to accomplish depending on your location. For example, going in a canoe or going camping can be a challenge if you're not located near a park or land that you can safely camp on. Um, these can also be quite expensive activities. Youth under 18 don't require a fishing license, but anyone between ages of 18 to 65 do, unless you're fishing on a license-free weekend like Family Day weekend. Um, so you need to have a fishing license other than those um, family or uh, license-free weekends. 
Um, however, there are wonderful programs available to loan equipment to accomplish these activities like tackle share. Um, this is run through the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters um, and they can loan out fishing equipment, um, little tackle boxes. Um, but if you're unaware of the loan or locations, um, this, these activities can be quite expensive. There's also safety risks. Um, no one without experience and a life jacket um, or the necessary safety equipment should go out in a canoe. Um, and that's something that I think everyone should have the opportunity to do, but it needs to be done safe. So a few of the improvements for the future. Um, taking what was done in the past decade and creating an easy to understand um, activities and lessons for everyone. Um, so like I mentioned, we have some pretty thick uh, documents like the primer for biodiversity. And this was created quite early um, for, from the Bean Board at the time uh, to help educators understand biodiversity related terminology. So, but it's very large and it's very hard to navigate. Um, so we, that's one of our improvements is we're continuously creating new lesson plans and activities, but still trying to uh, revamp our old ones to make sure they look great um, and hopefully able to translate some of them eventually. Um, we also want to make more time for outdoor space. Uh, learn about some plants and animals native to your area. I found doing education for fish and wildlife uh, with the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters when asking so many kids what your favorite animal is, it's, it's so often you hear things from Africa like cheetahs or lions. Um, but we have some pretty incredible, amazing uh, wildlife here in Ontario. So it's important to, to learn about those. If there's green space near you, um, you just need to find it and, and go for a walk, go observe the different trees. You don't have to be able to identify them to um, admire the biodiversity. Um, changes in government can also change funding. So hopefully funding will be uh, returned to being so we can uh, continue offering the grants and continue um, translating resources, creating more resources um, and kind of act as that hub for educators and teachers. And instead of focusing on elementary and high school, um, that's very important. There are um, subjects in the curriculum already for elementary grades uh, to incorporate biodiversity in there and in high school. Uh, so maybe there's more of a potential to focus on getting biodiversity into all post-secondary education. That's kind of where we fell short on the progress that kind of some progress instead of substantial is because um, it still hasn't been incorporated into many schools of business or other um, schooling that isn't environmental focused. So I just wanted to share a great big thank you for learning about BEAN, the Biodiversity Education and Awareness Network. Um, so uh, we are going to, I'm going to get Sandra to join me back on the screen here and we are going to be able to answer some questions um, and uh, we will get that word web um, back up on the screen as well so that we have maybe some ideas and topics for some conversation. Um, so yeah, perfect, awesome. Um, I wanted to ask you a quick question first, Sandra, before we get to uh, one of the questions that we got. Um, I wanted to ask, do you have any kind of simple actions or ideas that kind of an everyday person that maybe isn't in policy can can do to help communicate biodiversity, like maybe to their family members at Thanksgiving dinner or something like that? Is there any um, actions or ideas that you had? Yeah, so um, I think the survey results that I went through earlier are showing a lot of really great progress and we can see that um, uh, um, awareness is building. Sorry, I'm getting an error message here. 
um, we can see that we're already growing awareness. And one of the questions regarding, have you used the term biodiversity in a conversation with your friends or your family? Um, those are all really good signs um, that the message is getting out there. And so my recommendation really is, let's continue talking about it. Um, let's uh, put it into, you know, it's a, it can be complex terms. Let's put it into simple messaging. And I think, um, one of the recommendations or maybe even the challenge that I would put forward to everybody attending this summit um, would be, you know, moving forward, we're seeing awareness is increasing, but what about investigating opportunities to translate that awareness into actual behavior change? And so mm -hmm. it's not even just talking about it anymore. It's, you know, um, talking about it, but then offering suggestions for the little things that we can do. The, the quote that I had mentioned earlier um, in terms of like, it's gonna take thousands of little everyday activities um, for us to battle climate change and biodiversity loss. And so I think that would maybe be um, not necessarily a recommendation, I suppose it's a challenge to everybody to start to try and instill a sense of, you know, hope that we can make changes. And it's not just about awareness anymore. We're doing really good work on that front. It's about actual change now. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. We definitely have to just take action and yeah, continue to talk about it is so important. I Feel like all my family is tired of hearing me talk about biodiversity but i won't stop <laughs> yeah. Same. Um, okay so one of our questions um it's directed to me but we can definitely uh both maybe chip in um so it says hello jc and sandra thank you so much for the amazing talk in sandra's presentation we discussed what were some of the hardest challenges of communicating biodiversity and climate change such as misinformation or apathy um, our two biggest words in our word web um, what are some of the greatest challenges you have seen through these education programs and how has this changed since starting at Bean? Um, so that's a really great question. We, I am just kind of a recent co-chair of Bean, so I haven't been uh, a part of Bean for a very, very long time. But one challenge that I have seen kind of often and, and why Bean is so important in, in created and trying to get those resources out is um, when this 2007 curriculum did incorporate these themes of climate change, biodiversity, um, habitats and communities, the teachers in place that are then required to deliver these curriculum expectations probably don't have a biology background. They could have studied biology or science um, as part of their, their teachables, um, but a large majority of the educators or homeroom teachers that are are now being told like you need to teach your grade sixes about biodiversity um, in 2007 there would have been very few resources so i think that that was a huge that would have been a huge shock i i would find it easy to teach grade sixes about biodiversity but that's because i have an um, ecological restoration or a biology background uh, i can't imagine having done history and math as my teachables and then being told to teach climate change to some high school students. Um, so I think that was a, a big challenge initially when, and that's why Bean was really integral and important um, to getting those resources out there, making it easy for teachers to understand. Um, and then not only did the teachers have to understand those concepts, but they then have to relay that to children um, and that is that is a very a tricky mind set to, to be in and, and kind of switch on um, I now have to teach the biology of plants and growth and changes in plants to to grade threes I can understand photosynthesis in my adult brain but I now have to portray that to um, children that are, are seven and eight um, so that was I would say, kind of one of the greatest challenges through these education programs. Um, there's, I think there's gonna be a survey put out to everyone um, about the, each talk that you attend afterwards. Um, and I, I'm definitely gonna include, has anyone heard of Bean before listening to this talk today? Um, it's, it's a pretty small, organization like we're a volunteer group we're quite tiny um, and I, when i was able to go to conferences and speak about being at booths and things like that there were very very few people who had heard of being even though we were giving out micro grants we have free resources for teachers um, and teachers would often sometimes say like 
yeah, I paid for biodiversity and science-based resources on this other website because um, I didn't know how to teach it and I needed to. So I, I used some of my classroom funds, uh, material funds to, to purchase those, those lesson plans. So um, it's getting the word out there, getting the fact that these resources are free, are available from all of the board being members, all the resources are free. Um, so that's another challenge, of course, is just getting more educators aware of um, of these resources available. And social media is doing that. And like Sandra's presentation showed, internet searching is doing that. So if you search biodiversity education, hopefully Bean is one of the first few that pop up. Um, I didn't know if you had anything to add to that, Sandra. If there is another question for B, and if you want me to move on to that one. Uh, no, I, I think that was great. And um, the only thing I may add is that those resources that, that Bean develops and makes available are fabulous in terms of battling some of those challenges like misinformation or complexity um, because it distills it into comprehensible terms. And then that also makes it consistent if you know multiple teachers are using the same resources. So I think that's a great way to tackle that challenge. Absolutely. Um, our next question is, does Bean plan to focus more on post-secondary students in the future, including plans to target programs other than business? Um, yeah, absolutely. The only reason I mention um, schools of business is because that was the term directly written into the, um, the target with elementary, secondary, post-secondary, and schools of business. Um, and I'm sure that that was written in specifically because that was a huge area of lacking. There was probably no mention of biodiversity in many schools of business. Um, I definitely don't have the background to start writing activities for post-secondary students. Uh, but we're hoping that we are able to, yeah, that's kind of one of our future goals is to, to learn more about how the post-secondary curriculum and lessons are, are worked and, and made um, and target um, like invasive species topics, ecological restoration, which is what I have my degree in, but um, that's probably not mentioned in many other many other programs. So um, I definitely would love to see Bean progress um, to that point. For right now, we, though, we have the capacity to focus on mainly grades one to eight and then a couple high school activities, but definitely on um, our, our wish list or our future list for sure. Uh, okay, maybe we'll give uh, two more minutes for a couple other questions to potentially roll in. Um, this session was a 9 to 12. We just gave ourselves a little extra time um, to make sure that um, we didn't have to rush. So uh, we probably are going to wrap up a little bit early, uh, but that's okay. It's a very sunshiny day where I am located. Um, but I just wanted to share a couple things in closing here. Um, please visit the Ontario Biodiversity Council's website at ontariobiodiversitycouncil.ca. Uh, Sandra mentioned a lot of the resources she spoke about are on that website. Um, and you can also go there to register for more sessions. Bean will be releasing four, three videos in the month of July, all focusing on different citizen science initiatives. Um, and then in August, we actually have five videos to release on virtual education and kind of how a lot of places that are communicating biodiversity, like the Hunting and Fishing Heritage Center, have had to go virtual in the tools that they've used. We have the Emerging Leaders in Biodiversity talking about how they transformed um, in-person workshops to a podcast. Uh, so that's super neat and cool. Um, so those will be released at the beginning of each month, um, but you have to register to get those links. Um, also, please visit, visit the Bean website, check it out. If you've never been, um, see some of those resources. Please note though, that we are continuing to work on the website and add more. Um, when we got our cut in funding, we also lost our whole website. So we've been having to build it back up. Uh, so it is kind of a, a constant working point for myself. Um, join our Facebook groups, uh, follow some of our board members on Facebook, Instagram, some have Twitter. 
And thank you so, so much for listening. I hope to see you at other summit sessions. And uh, don't forget this recording will be on the Ontario Biodiversity Council website for viewing soon. And I just wanna extend my biggest thank you to Sandra for talking about the policy side of things because that was not my forte and I was really happy to um, have her to collaborate with on that. And thank you for everyone for your participation in these uh, little activities. This word, word map is beautiful. <laughs> Thanks, JC. And I'll just reiterate, um, thank you for having me. It was my pleasure to be here and talk about some of the great work um, that's being done. Um, and yeah, definitely check out the, the Biodiversity Council website. Michael has put a link in the chat for folks. Um, and as JC said, be sure to catch uh, some more of the summit presentations as they happen throughout the next few months, because there's a lot of really great information coming up. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye.